So I turn to St. Thomas's Haemophilia Centre. As with all the presentations on Haemophilia Centres, um, these are intended as an introduction or an overview. They're not an exhaustive account um, of every piece of material, um, nor are they intended to be the last word in, in, in any sense. In relation to St. Thomas's, there is substantially less documentary material of relevance than there is in relation to both Cardiff and Oxford, perhaps unsurprisingly because of the particular roles occupied by Professor Bloom at Cardiff and Dr. Ritzer at Oxford. Um, um, and I'm going to be looking at the material thematically rather than in a strictly chronological um, order. You will see when we get to it that we do have the evidence of uh, uh, Professor Savage to the Archer Inquiry, both written and oral evidence, which um, you may find quite illuminating when we return to the detail of it. So St Thomas's Haemophilia Centre um, is one of the major haemophilia centres in, uh, in England. Uh, it was led by Professor G Ingram, who was usually known as Professor Illsley Ingram, uh, at, um, from 1956 until 1979. Um, and uh, uh, in, as at 1970, it had around 157 registered patients. If we can have up on screen, please, Henry, DHSC 0100026 underscore 084, please. We can see a little of, of, of the history of St. Thomas's here. This is a meeting, or two meetings, to discuss London haemophilia centres, 11th of February 1970 at the Department of Health. We can see that those present include Dr. Yellow Lees, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, and Dr. Maycock. And then in terms of haemophilia centre clinicians, we have Professor Hardesty, who was director of the haemophilia centre at Great Ormond Street, Dr. Dormandy, that's Dr. Catherine Dormandy of the Royal Free, and then Dr. Ingram, representing St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, and if we look under the heading introduction, we'll see a, a meeting with the directors of three London haemophilia centres was preceded by an office meeting at which the situation in London was discussed with particular reference to the Royal Free. Um, and um, the office meeting, so not including the haemophilia centre directors, was an internal Department of Health discussion um, about the extent to which there should be reorganisation of the haemophilia centres within London. And it was identified uh, in paragraph one that the department's policy should be aimed at a reduction in the number of centres in London. There were then 13. Uh, Great Ormond Street would remain on any view because it dealt with children. The Lewisham was also going to remain. And it was thought there was a need for a major treatment centre in London. And then there were discussions about the rival facilities of the Royal Free and St. Thomas's. If we go over the page to paragraph six, we can see then, uh, then Dr. Ingram, later Professor Ingram, uh, talks here about St. Thomas's. So it gives us a snapshot as at 1970. He says that work at his centre at St. Thomas's Hospital was increasing steadily. This was partly due to the fact that haemophiliacs could now be given more and better treatment with the result that patients were attending more frequently, but also because it was becoming more widely known that St. Thomas's was particularly active in haemophiliac work. Dr. Ingram said he needed an additional technician to help carry the current workload. <coughs> and a deputy director and a further technician was desirable to enable monitoring of cryoprecipitate material to be undertaken. And then there's a reference to space. Cases requiring major surgery were referred to Oxford because of the shortage of anti-haemophiliac material. If therapeutic treatment was to continue to expand, as currently indicated, there would be a need for a further anti-haemophiliac material. Um, and, but Dr. Ingram then says he requires um, more staff. And then in reply to a question from Dr. Maycock, Dr. Ingram said that out of the 157 registered cases at his centre, some 20 needed to attend frequently and another 20 came uh, fairly uh, often. Um, and if we go to the next page, there's a discussion in paragraph 11. Uh, 
of the physical facilities at both St Thomas's uh, and uh, at the Royal Free. In relation to St Thomas's, it's reported that there'll be space for a haemophilia department in the rebuilding scheme, um, but that may not be available for another um, uh, seven years. And then if we go to the next paragraph, we'll see then issues about supply of, of uh, treatment materials are discussed. And it's recorded that Dr. Ingram stressed the need for additional material, uh, likely to be cryoprecipitate given the time, if therapeutic treatment of haemophiliacs was to continue to expand. Dr. Maycock outlined the measures which had been taken to increase production of this material. It was expected that in three to four years, good supplies of cryoprecipitate, etc., cetera, uh, would be available. And then if we go further down towards the last paragraph on the page, please, Henry, we can see the conclusions were, or the agreement was, that it seemed likely that St. Thomas's and the Royal Free would naturally evolve as the main haemophilia centres in London. And if we could then go, Henry, to DHSC 01000005 underscore 061, go to the next page. This is a document dated November 1973. It's prepared by Dr. Sheila Waiter in the Department of Health, addressed to Dr. Reed, who I think from recollection was the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. It's headed Haemophilia Centres in London. Um, um, and it, it gives a degree of insight into the way in which Haemophilia Centres were, were recognised as leading um, or reference centres. Um, so we see in the second paragraph, haemophilia centres, where the condition could be diagnosed, the patient registered and treatment at short notice made available, were originally designated by the Medical Research Council, and HM 68.8, that's a department publication, formally announced takeover of responsibility for designation by the Department of Health. If we go to the next paragraph. Three centres, Oxford, Manchester and Sheffield, were designated as major centres, in addition to providing facilities for diagnosis of haemophilia and related disorders and the monitoring of treatment, these centres were expected to act as reference centres. So we see here the development of the, the, the concept of reference centres, which assumes much greater importance in the following years. And also to provide facilities for undertaking major surgery. None of the 13 haemophilia centres in London was designated a major centre at that time, although it was noted that the situation might have to be reviewed. The next paragraph then refers to the February 1970 meeting that we've already looked at. Um, and then it's recorded that a survey of the activities of the 13 haemophilia centres in London revealed the majority of cases were registered at Great Ormond Street, St Thomas's, the Royal Free, the London um, and Lewisham Hospital. And if we go further down, the first um, uh, three of the centres listed above, so that includes St Thomas's, were evolving as major treatment and reference centres. In addition, they were working with each other to offer a coordinated service as far as they were able to at that time. And then it's recorded that Professor Hardesty, Professor Ingram, Dr. Dormandy, um, so representing their Great Ormond Street, St. Thomas's and the Royal Free, submitted to the department a scheme outlining the requirements for providing a full service to haemophiliacs in the London area and its large catchment area. Um, if we go on the next... On, on this page, Henry, to the second paragraph, please. We can see there's a reference there to a further meeting in October 1970, um, uh, where if major surgery or complex management was required, directors would refer their patients to one of the larger London centres, probably the Royal Free or St Thomas's, or to the Special Treatment Centre uh, at um, Oxford. And then there's a discussion of whether to, to designate whether to use the title regional or reference centre as a designation. But effectively, this is when St Thomas's emerges as, a, as what's recognised as a, as a reference uh, centre. Um, if we go over to the next page. We see the role of these reference centres referred to here as regional or major administrative centres. So the, the proposal, which we, we know is, is accepted, is that the haemophilia centres at the Royal Free and St Thomas's 
should be designated regional or major administrative centres for the treatment of haemophilia. And the major centres at Oxford, Manchester and Sheffield should be renamed. And then if we go further down, we can see it said the roles of the major centres would be those of administrative centres primarily, but centres to whom reference could be made in the event of encountering difficulties in the management of a case or obtaining therapeutic agents or services. In practice, most centres already refer, when necessary, to the Royal Free St Thomas's and Oxford centres, and a clear statement of their designated role would be a confirmation of the situation which exists now. So I've drawn attention to that, not simply because it shows that this is the point in time at which St Thomas's becomes a reference centre, but because there have been some uh, inquiries made by core participants through their legal representatives of, of quite how these centres came to be so important um, and that's something we'll no doubt be looking at um, over the course of the coming hearings a, 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 again. But this helps provide an explanation as to what the particular role of the reference centres was. And then we see how that then feeds into there being the regular meetings of reference centre directors, including therefore a representative of St Thomas's, over the coming years, which leads the response of haemophilia clinicians to both hepatitis um, and, um, um, and uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, we know that Professor Ingram, as well as being the key consultant and director at St Thomas's at this time, was a member of the Medical Research Council's Cryoprecipitate Working Party. You can see that from OXUH 00008310031. And Um, this is not a document we've looked at before. Um, it, so you can see it's headed Medical Research Council, and it says MRC Cryoprecipitate Working Party, minutes of special meeting held at Oxford on Tuesday, 1st of October 1968. And it, it appears to be in part out of this that, that the, you, what we now know as UKHCDO later revolves. Um, and we see amongst those present as members of the Working Party on Cryoprecipitate are Dr Biggs from Oxford, uh, Dr. Ingram representing St. Thomas's, Dr. Maycock, uh, and Dr. Ritzer, um, and then a number of other directors uh, um, and, and others uh, invited. And if we just go to the bottom of the page, we'll see that amongst other matters being considered by, by this committee on which Professor Ingram was, uh, sat was a survey of the incidence of jaundice in haemophilia. Uh, D Professor Ingram was also on um, a, a, a Factor 9 working party. Um, and if we just look briefly at that, OXUH 00009670004. And we can see here, this is headed Working Party on Factor 9 Concentrate. This is its seventh meeting, it's, it's, it's an, uh, just really intended as an example, uh, and it's meeting in January of 1978. We can see it's chaired by Dr. Ritzer, and then we have present a number of people. Um, the second named is Professor uh, uh, Ilsley Ingram. Um, I don't need to um, spend time for present purposes on the detail. There's discussion of um, uh, two trials um, uh, relating to um, uh, factor nine products. But if we go to page six, this is not specific to St. Thomas's, but it, there's just something I wanted to draw attention to in light of evidence we heard from Dr. Colvin yesterday. So next page, please, Henry. Again, in the context of a very long and detailed record of a discussion about a, a particular trial, um, if we look at the last sentence of the first main paragraph, you'll see um, here there's, there's a discussion about hepatitis and about non-A, non-B types of hepatitis and what's being looked for. And then it says this, Dr. Dr. Wyck, Wyck thought Professor Zuckerman would think it an advantage to have stored samples in case the possibility of tests for non-A, non-B hepatitis virus became available in the future. We don't know with any confidence what the position was in terms of stored samples at St Thomas's, but I've drawn attention to this because obviously the issue of stored samples at the London Hospital 
and any possible interest that Professor Zuckerman might have in those stored samples came up in, in, in the course of Dr. Colvin's evidence yesterday. Um, Dr. Oh, Professor Ingram was also a member of the expert group on the treatment of haemophilia, and we can see that at DHSC 01000007 underscore 010. I hope I have the requisite number of zeros there. DHSC 01000007 underscore 010. First page of it. That was the second page, so it was the first page we needed. Yeah, DHSC 01000007 underscore 010. If you don't have it, Henry, don't worry. Oh, there we are. So we're, we're going to look tomorrow during the Oxford presentation a little more at, at, at um, some of the background to the committee, uh, to this group. But we can see it's in, headed the expert group on the treatment of haemophilia. We're told it first convened in March 1973 to advise the department on the likely trends in haemophilia treatment and related matters, and its terms of reference are there set out. And, and a, a particular function it had was advising the department on, on uh, uh, issues relevant to self-sufficiency, so likely, um, likely demand for product. And we can see it was decided to reconvene it in 1976, and we have Professor Ingram, um, or identified as attending that in paragraph three. Um, Professor Ingram was also, as a reference centre director, uh, an attendee at the reference centre director meetings of UKHCDO and co-chair of UKHCDO for a shortish period, 1978 to 1979. He was succeeded at St Thomas's by Professor Savage in 1979, and, and Professor Savage remained director of the centre then until 2006. Um, we have very few annual returns um, currently that we've been able to track down from the centre, but we have one from 1983, which gives us a snapshot of um, the, the patient profile then. It is HCDO 000 166 underscore 003. So we can see here it's an, the 1983 annual return for St. Thomas is completed by Dr. Savage. The total number of haemophilia A patients treated during 1983 and 90. There are no carriers of haemophilia A treated in that year. And then we have 13 with von Willebrand's disease treated during the year. And then we can see the, the material that was being used in the course of 1983. So um, uh, NHS human factor concentrate um, uh, used um, the volume there for hospital treatment is 133,763 units. And for home treatment, 109,900 units. You'll see, sir, there's no cryoprecipitate identified as being used. And then we see really very significant quantities of different commercial products being used. So we have for alpha factor 8, profilate, 185,223 units for uh, hospital treatment and for home treatment, 38,982. The armor factor 8, factor 8, 890,650 units for hospital treatment, 924,257 um, for home treatment. And then Highland, Haemophil, 
1,129,775 um, units and 779,000 odd for home treatment. So we can see there in contrast to, for example, what Dr. Colvin was describing at the London Hospital for around this time, um, very significant quantities of commercial product, much more than the NHS product, and commercial product very clearly featuring large in, in the home treatment. There's, there's a, um, a modest amount of DDAVP recorded. And then we see for von Willebrand's disease, there cryoprecipitate has had a role to play. There's no home treatment for von Willebrand's. It's cryoprecipitate and then um, a, 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 um, profilate, factor eight, and haemophil and a modest amount of DDAVP. Um, and then if we go, please, Henry, to HCDO 00000166 underscore 005. We can see the annual return in relation to haemophilia B. Um, 23 haemophilia B patients treated during the, the, the calendar year 1983 at St. Thomas's, no carriers treated. And we can see there the predominant treatment is with the NHS factor 9, both for hospital uh, and for home treatment. Um, there is then a specific entry for the use of factor 8, and we can see from what's written at the bottom that appears to have been for a particular patient who had both severe factor nine deficiency and mild haemophilia A. Um, but, the, but the picture there in any event is one, at this time, similar to what we saw at the, the, the London Hospital of, of, of NHS factor nine concentrate being used to treat the haemophilia B patients. And we know from other material that there wasn't the same problem in terms of supply um, of NHS factor nine as, as there was with NHS factor eight. Um, if we could then go, please, Henry, to IPSN 0000584 underscore 003, please. This is a document we looked at in part yesterday with Dr. Colvin. So it's a report. It, it may well have... Well, I'm not sure who it was prepared, but I was about to say it may well have been prepared for UK HCDO, but I, I don't think one can necessarily draw that inference. Um, uh, it may have been a Spaywood document. It's the use of concentrates in the treatment of inhibitor patients in the UK, 1981 to 1983. I'll look in a minute at what it says about Professor Savage and St Thomas's, but it may be relevant just to observe the first main paragraph, again, in, in light of some of the evidence we heard yesterday from Dr Colvin, as can be seen, so this gives national statistics about the treatment of inhibitor patients, and then it says this, as can be seen, only about 50% of the registered inhibitor patients receive treatment in any given year. This may be explained by the inhibitor patients leading more cautious lives because of their condition and thus bleeding less frequently, or by the fact that patients who live a considerable distance from their centre may prefer to try to resolve the bleed by bed rest than to risk a painful journey and a stay in hospital. And then it goes on to say that many older patients were educated to believe that minor bleeds in inhibitor patients were better untreated and thus only present with serious bleeds. But you'll see there the reference to this, this cohort of patients, patients with inhibitors, perhaps um, not being treated as regularly as, as other patients because of, of um, lifestyle and management, if I can put it that way. Uh, if we just go down the page to the next paragraph, Henry, please, we can see in terms of the overall picture that human factor eight is the most commonly used form of treatment for inhibitor patients. Um, and it's said that despite AIDS, the usage has remained steady over the three-year period, 81, 82, 83. If then, specifically in relation to St. Thomas's, we could go to page four, please. We can see, picking it up at the bottom of that page, first of all, we can see how Professor Savage treated inhibitor patients. It says St. Thomas's have 18 inhibitor patients, of whom 14 are treated with human factor 8 for most bleeds. 
The remaining four are very high responders, and these have been treated with FIX, or autoplex for minor bleeds, and human factor eight or autoplex for major bleeds. And then if we go to the next page, we're told Dr. Savage has been reluctant to use porcine factor eight in the past, but claims to have been reassured by recent publications and by the approval of our UK product licence. I think that does tell us that this is a spade of documents here. Um, and then we get, just get an insight into what's said to be the, the overall approach of St. Thomas's. St. Thomas's have a very aggressive approach towards surgery in haemophilia and carry out a large number of joint replacement operations. Porcine factor eight is an obvious choice for surgery and inhibitor patients, and Dr. Savage intends to use it if the need arises. He's obtaining some equipment from Sweden to enable him to carry out extracorporeal adsorption of antibody to immobilized protein A and hopes to have the system operating by mid-85. This will enable him to carry out surgery on the high teacher inhibitor patients, in which case he will use porcine factor eight as one of the forms of replacement therapy. Dr. Savage considers the most important restriction on wider usage of porcine factor eight is cost, particularly relative to human factor eight. So we can see there uh, uh, clear information about Dr. Savage's approach to treating this particular cohort of patients with inhibitors, but more broadly, we're told um, that he, ha he or the hospital have an aggressive approach towards surgery um, in haemophilia. Um, and uh, we can just see if we go to page 12 of this document, please, Henry. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just read it out because it's, it's a figure. So the, the system is slowing down t today, sir. There's a table which has um, records of the sales of high HC. That's the porcine factor eight product. And we can see that the usage at St. Thomas's is, is really relatively low given the number of patients it had. Um, in 1981, uh, the sales were 45,300 units, um, 30,000 in 1982 and, and none in 1983. Okay. Thank you, Henry. So the line for St. Thomas's is, is 10 lines or so down. Um, if we then go, please, Henry, to CGRA 00000605, please. Um, this is a document we'll see from December 1985. It's an internal cutter document described as UK Situation Report, uh, November 1985. Um, and it, it, it's setting out at that point in time um, who's buying what in terms of CO8HT um, product. Uh, if we go to the last page, please, Henry... Last paragraph, um, we, we have a snapshot from the uh, pharmaceutical representatives of St. Thomas's. It says that they visited Jeffrey Savage. The UK haemophilia organisation was described in depth by him. If that's a reference to UK HEDO, it seems likely we'll come on and hear what his views were about the organisation um, as related to the Archer inquiry. Followed by a description of the St. Thomas's setup. He has 250 to 300 patients attending the centre. They use five to six million IU a year. St. Thomas is distributes to most of the haemophilia centres in the southeast Thames region. And you've heard Dr. Winter, sir, describe um, some of the supply issues that he said beset the uh, South Thames region. And he does not use any NHS material at all, neither factor eight nor factor nine. So we're told here that by the end of 1985, Professor Savage is solely using commercial rather than NHS products, including for the treatment of haemophilia B. Now, might that be because the commercial product was heat treated? Yes. Uh, and it, it wasn't until, I think, October 85 that uh, the 
NHS heat treated product was on general release. We'll, we'll see later Professor Savage's um, uh, uh, support for heat treated products and, and we've heard from Dr Winter at an earlier stage than many others. Um, that is no doubt absolutely right sir, that, that the reason and we'll see it quite clearly that he was using by um, certainly 1984-1985 commercial products so extensively was because of his view of the, 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 the relative safety of heat treatment. Um, may have been other issues including costs but certainly that's part and parcel of, of, of what, what, what seems to have been his reasoning. Well the cost might be surprising um, given that NHS was supposedly free uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of the cost of delivery to the unit, the uh, individual hospital. Yes, cost may have influenced his choice as between products rather yes. than commercial versus NHS. Um, uh, uh, but we see there again um, a, a sense of the size of the of, 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 of the unit. Um, uh, it may just be instructive to look at pages two and three of this document, not insofar as they specifically relate to St Thomas's, but just an insight as to the role of pharmaceutical companies and, and, and their visits to haemophilia clinicians more generally. Um, we can see, if we go to the second page of the document, please, Henry, um, bottom half, Thank you. So there's a reference there under the heading um, uh, NHS supplies to uh, the expectation that supplies of 8Y will increase to all centres. Um, and then there's a, a recognition in the, in the next paragraph of what they think the commercial share will increase to in 1986, their target sales. And we can see there set out targets for the salesmen to achieve or surpass to give a market share of 18%, and there's a particular target we see towards the bottom for St Thomas's of, of half a million. If we go to the next page, um, there's uh, an assumption built into these, these targets. The LHS will not exceed 25 million IU in 86. We can stop the infiltration of alpha into cutter accounts by positive direct selling against alpha. We do expect Alpha to continue to take virgin haemophiliacs at the rate of 5% per annum until CoHHS is available to the UK customer. And then it set out what the commercial factor rate market for 1986 is in terms of profits. And I just draw attention to that because we've had heard some evidence from Dr Winter and Dr Colvin of, of regular visits from pharmaceutical companies and we'll, we'll see some of that in no doubt in relation to other clinicians including Professor Savage. We see here clearly, perhaps unsurprisingly, what the purpose of those visits may have been from the perspective of the pharmaceutical representative. It is to increase sales. Uh, and then, um, if we go, please, to uh, DHSC... Just, just, just before yes. you do that, um, just intrigued by the, the first sentence of the paragraph at the very bottom of the page. Yes, under Highland... Uh, under uh, Alpha. Oh, under um, Alpha, yes. Uh, the second second paragraph. We have to be alert to the fact. So the commercial expectation uh, was that product which uh, had lost market share because it had too many uh, extraneous proteins, it was less pure, in that sense, might flood the U.S. market, the U.K. market. Yes, at low prices. Yes. And it's recorded there that Alphas increased their price in the southwest region, the Mersey Liverpool region. They plan to increase their price to other centres in January or April. Um, yes, I would, one just note to the very bottom of the page under the heading Highland the material sold to Newcastle may possibly have been diverted to St Thomas's. We, we don't, I think, know um, why um, uh, that has happened. Um, but we can see certainly from the annual return in 1983, really through to what we see here in 1985, that um, in contrast to the picture at some other centres, Professor Savage is very much a clinician who has been wedded for reasons we'll e explore to, to commercial products um, um, for much of, that, of the relevant period. Um, if we go then, please, Henry, to DHSC 000... 
2293 underscore 019. Um, wait till we get there. Uh, this happens to be a meeting of the Royal College of Physicians in January 1986. It's a joint working party on super-regional services and haemophilia reference centres. If we go, please, to page 6, just to show the development of St Thomas's and the services it offers, under the heading St Thomas's Centre, it said, the working party had no further information tabled from Dr Savage, but the problems were well known to the working party. St Thomas's was offering a tertiary care service across London and right down to the coast. Many centres were referring patients there. Their orthopaedic surgery was particularly good. Dr Kernoff mentioned that Dr Savage had produced convincing evidence that there were major advantages, financially speaking, in the service being organised from large centres with good evidence that orthopaedic surgery is cost-effective. And we can see from the next paragraph that agreement is reached that St Thomas's um, will be recommended for supra-regional designation. So it effectively then has a role in relation to a number of the other smaller centres um, in the southeast region. Um, and then if we could have, please, BPLL 0001988 underscore 003. Um, this is now 1989. Again, this is just an overview of the facilities at St services at St Thomas's, we can see in 1989, so perhaps rather more than the seven years that, 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 that Professor Ingram had hoped, there is a new haemophilia centre at St Thomas's um, about to um, uh, be opened or move into. Um, uh, perhaps somewhat optimistically, Professor Savage was writing to PFL, uh, and there's another letter I don't need to refer you to, um, to BPL asking for a financial contribution because of financial constraints within the NHS. But in any event, 1989, new facilities being opened. I'll just turn to Professor Savage in a little more detail. Um, his background, he described to the Archer Inquiry as being as a physician and as a medical scientist, not as a conventional haematologist. And if we could have on screen, please, Henry, A-R-C-H 0000011. A-R-C-H 5-0-11. So this is a transcript of a day's evidence to the Archer Inquiry. And if we could go, please, to page, um, it's page 113, using the numbers at the bottom, but I think it'll be page 114 of your document, Henry. Um, we can see, he says, in the top half of the page, I am, or rather was, Professor of Medicine at St Thomas's Hospital, most of my training is as a physician and as a medical scientist, not as a conventional haematologist, which may explain why there are divergent opinions perhaps in the text. I think the text is a reference to his written statement, which he produced to the Archer Inquiry about two o'clock in the morning on the day he gave evidence. I've graduated from the University of Cambridge. I've specialist accreditation in medicine and chemistry, and I have, for my sins, spent a lot of time abroad training. And while I was abroad, I worked in Stockholm, um, which is probably one of the most prestigious places in the field of blood clotting and coagulation, and I have my higher degrees from there. And we have details of his, of, of, of his CV. Uh, he worked from 1968, pretty much consistently through to 1979, uh, in Stockholm in various capaci capacities. Um, uh, um, and then... Um, in 1979, he transferred from 
the Department of Blood Coagulation in Stockholm to St Thomas's and took up the director's approach, uh, um, post upon what I assume is the retirement of Professor Ingram. Uh, and Professor Savage was then in charge of St Thomas's from September 1979 until September 2006 when he retired. Uh, he died, I think, five years later in 2011. Um, so that, that's an overview, sir, of the, the centre and, in, in a very broad sense, some of its activities during the, the relevant um, decades. I'm just going to turn now to the uh, theme of home treatment at St Thomas's. If we could have, please, Henry, DHSC 010026 underscore 091, please. DHSC 01000026 underscore 091. Thank you. So um, this is, um, as we see from the title, um, a note of a meeting with representatives of the Haemophilia Society, November 1970 at the Department of Health. Um, Dr. Ingram was there at, um, um, as a representative of the Haemophilia Society. And we can see the purpose of the meeting is described as being to, um, to discuss certain matters relating to the treatment of haemophiliacs. There is then a discussion under the heading supply of concentrates halfway down the page um, to the supply of cryoprecipitate. And it's recorded by Dr. Obank, who is there for the Department of Health, that the supply of cryoprecipitate had risen significantly over the last three to four years production was continually increasing. The need for further expansion had been stressed by directors of the London Haemophilia Centres at a recent meeting. The department had the matter under constant review. And, and then there's a discussion about the production of factor nine. Um, and then um, we can see if we go two pages further on, please, to page three, Henry. We, we'll see from this that Dr. Ingram was an early advocate of home treatment and introduced it early at the centre at St Thomas's. So it's the paragraph um, headed home treatment, paragraph eight. Um, Dr Obank said that the reference in the society's paper to certain patients having been trained to administer their own infusions of concentrate of fresh frozen plasma I don't know whether that should have been all or of, was the first that the department had heard of this form of treatment. Dr. Ingram confirmed that at present there were only few such cases, but he thought the number was likely to increase. Dr. Ingram explained that the material was kept in deep freeze for use when the patient had an acute bleed. Dr. Obank said that if such a system was developed, it could mean that sizable quantities of material would be held in individual reserves. This was not likely to be regarded with favor unless supplies were plentiful. This method of treatment would have to be evaluated before any consideration could be given to the department funding the provision of home deep freezers. So you'll see that, so as at 1970, Professor Ingram and the Haemophilia Society raising home treatment with the department. It would appear um, that part of the aim of the meeting was to obtain funding for the department to enable the purchase of uh, freezers for people's homes so that people could have home treatment using cryoprecipitate at home. Um, and if we go, please, to CBLA 0006658. This is a letter from um, Professor Ingram to Dr. Maycock at BPL, October 1972, and it's discussing home treatment. Uh, and uh, he explains that there are two haemophiliacs um, 
uh, both severely affected age 15 and 19 who require frequent treatments for early spontaneous bleed, sometimes several times a week. Um, both are losing considerable time from work, coming here for their treatments. Both have been taught to set up their own gyps and give themselves treatments, and both have given themselves cryoprecipitate and EHF, that's Elstree Haemophilic Factor is, is what that stand, stood for in, in the correspondence, at home as well as here. So home treatment had been instituted by Professor Ingram in th this very early part of the 70s using cryoprecipitate. And then the request here for, for, for convenience is whether there could be made available a regular supply of the Elstree uh, factor uh, concentrate. Um, and if we go to the bottom of the page, um, we can see, uh, he says, we're pressing on with training as many severe haemophiliacs as possible to give themselves their own treatment. Um, in fact, for those um, who do not have very frequent bleeds, it is not so urgent to set them up actually to treat themselves at home, but those who need to attend here more than twice a month would save considerable time if they could avoid the journey. In some instances, it's been possible for patients to obtain a domestic deep freeze and thus to be able to treat themselves with cryoprecipitate. But then he looks forward to the day when there'll be sufficient concentrate for the patients to keep a stock uh, at home. So again, further indication of the early use of home treatment using cryoprecipitate at St. Thomas's. But, but uh, also a description of, of, of uh, an, an aspiration that concentrate would be more widely available. And if we move on to BPLL 0003662, we can see now the, the further developments in, in home treatment in St. Thomas's. So again, this is earlier than a number of other centres had home treatment um, programmes. By now, we're in April 1976, and home treatment seems to be um, uh, fully established at St. Thomas's. Uh, it's, again, from Professor Ingram to Dr. Maycock, home treatment and haemophilia study. So there's a study ongoing. We are now well in our stride with the home treatment study and have taken in as many patients as the supplies of Factor Eight concentrate allow. Um, you're kindly letting us have 100 bottles a month. I do not wish to seem greedy, but I wonder whether the supply of plasma from the regions would allow you to increase that allocation so we could take in uh, more patients. Um, uh, and then you'll see from the last sentence uh, of the letter that uh, it's, it's a study involving two centres. We can see that from later publications. St Thomas is, is using Elstree Concentrate in its study, Oxford using material produced by Dr Bidwell for their part of the study. Um, and we can see if we go to DHSC 00021919, underscore zero one nine you can see a little more about that study home treatment in haemophilia clinical social and economic advantages so it's co-authored by a number of uh, clinicians um, and others including professor ingram uh, for st thomas's and dr ritzer um, miss spooner and and dr biggs for oxford um, and we can, I think, just look at the summary, probably 28 severely affected haemophiliacs were observed for three months under treatment as hospital outpatients and for the subsequent nine months while treating themselves at home. Delay in receiving treatment and financial costs were both clearly reduced by home treatment. The patients recovered from individual bleeds more quickly and reported a greater sense of personal freedom and independence. The amount of treatment required did not materially change and no untoward effects were noted. And we'll see from the very bottom of the page, it involved 12 severe haemophiliacs at Oxford and 16 attending the centre at St Thomas's. Um, it, it, it's clear from the uh, detail of the uh, study that the, um, the home treatment by this time for the purposes of the study is with concentrate. Um, but it, it, it's with NHS concentrate. Um, Dr... Uh, Professor Savage continued with the home treatment programme. If we look at HCDO 00000406, we can see here um, a meeting of reference centre directors in September of 1980. Uh, 
Professor Bloom is present, Dr. Ritzer, and we can see Dr. Savage is there present, re representing St. Thomas's as, as, as the reference centre director there. And if we go, please, to page... Eleven. There's a discussion uh, about freeze-dried cryoprecipitate. Halfway down the paragraph, we then see Dr. Savage posing a question. Dr. Savage asked what the policy was of the Haemophilia Reference Centre directors regarding the use of cryoprecipitate for the treatment of haemophiliac patients and for home therapy. So this is as at 1980, Dr. Savage raising the possibility of using cryoprecipitate rather than concentrates exclusively for home treatment. And Professor Bloom's response, it was a matter for the individual directors to decide. So you'll, you'll see, and we've, we've looked at it before in, 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 in other days of the hearing, the minutes then recall Professor Bloom referring to a discussion in 1978, that's before Dr. Savage had become reference centre director at St. Thomas's where there had been a discussion about the merits of cryoprecipitate versus concentrate for home therapy. And there, the reference centre directors had agreed that factor VIII concentrates were preferred for home therapy. And I think I've already mentioned previously, perhaps something of a tension between Professor Bloom saying, well, it's a matter for the individual director, but then saying, but actually we all agree it should, concentrates are better than, than cryoprecipitate. Um, whether Professor Savage did in fact use cryoprecipitate for home therapy, we can't elicit from the documents we've seen. Certainly by 1983, the annual return would suggest he wasn't. But whether he did so in any point between 1979 and 1982, we, we, we don't know. Well, it, it does say in the, the, the sentence uh, towards the top of the page, it was agreed that the material, that is, uh, I think, freeze... Um, which material was that? That was a particular um, um, form of freeze-dried cryoprecipitate. So freeze-dried cryoprecipitate. Yes, yeah, so that was a not different, suitable. not, not yeah. the conventional cryoprecipitate um, um, th th that we are generally discussing. And it's that which, as I understand it, was agreed was not really a suitable product to use for home therapy. I, I, I follow. And then certainly my reading of the minutes, but it'll be a matter for you, sir, is that the discussion then goes on to talk about the merits of, of conventional ordinary, cryo. Ordinary cryoprecipitate. Yes. Um, versus concentrate more generally. Um, in, um, in terms of uh, interactions with pharmaceutical companies, we can see, um, uh, for example, similar communications between Dr. Savage and Spaywood, as we've seen with Professor Bloom, so if, by way of example, we look at IPSN 00003233 underscore 007, um, this is uh, an example of, of, of uh, letters between Mr. Williams um, representing Spaywood and Dr. Savage. This is in October 1979, and we can see there's obviously been a meeting. It was a great pleasure to meet you on Wednesday. I much appreciated your interest in our work. There's then a discussion about Spaywood's porcine product. Uh, and, and then we can see there is an offer in the last paragraph that Spaywood will supply co human factor eight. Um, I don't need to go into the details of it. We might come on to it tomorrow with Oxford, sir. Spaywood was not the manufacturer of CoA, but there was at this, it was at this time the distributor of it, or a distributor of it in the UK. Um, uh, and um, uh, um, th there is then some subsequent correspondence between um, um, Professor Savage and, and, and Mr. Williams. I don't think I need to go into it, but again, it, it just exemplifies the kind of uh, communications that, that we uh, um, ha have seen in relation to other centres. Professor Savage returned to this in um, uh, a little more, or, or dealt with this issue in some detail in his evidence to the Archer inquiry. So if we could go back, please, Henry, to ARCH 5011. And 
if we could go to page number 106, probably 107 for you. Um, he talked first of all uh, about um, the role of haemophilia centre directors in relation to um, purchasing blood products. And we can pick it up at the bottom of page 106 where Professor Savage says, I started in 79 and I inherited, shall we say, a rather low funding level um, from where it was done through the usual mechanism, the Department of Health down to the regional health authority. Um, uh, and then if we pick it up halfway down the page, he says, in terms of the product of which 85% of haemophilia costs rest with, one had product availability through two other sources. One was from the blood transfusion organization that supplied either fresh frozen plasma or cryoprecipitate, which is a sort of semi-enriched form of plasma, or the blood products laboratory, which at that time was at Elstree, and a little bit at Oxford, and a little bit here, and a little bit there. And what they did, they had an arrangement with the blood transfusion service, whereby the blood transfusion service supplied them free of charge, notionally free of charge, rather, with plasma and cryoprecipitate this semi-prepared thing which in return was fractionated into a more purified form of factor VIII and factor IX and albumin and then returned back notionally free to the blood transfusion service for distribution out to the individual district hospitals. So that was the bulk product which was notionally free. So that's Professor Savage's description of what was available um, um, in terms of NHS product either from the regional transfusion um, uh, centre or, or from the fractionation centres. And then he says this, because there was always a shortfall and that shortfall went down to perhaps as much as 60%. So you only had 40% back on what was sent in, which in effect was not enough anyway. There had to be a source of money to purchase blood products, usually from the United States. So that was where the money came on through the regional health authority, divided down to districts, and any money that was loosely at a district level went into purchasing that should it be necessary. And of course, it never was enough because patients always wanted more and there was a general move at that time in the mid-70s to the 80s to actually increase the usage um, of uh, patients' factor. And then if we pick it up over the next page, um, uh, Professor Savage was asked some questions about um, how the material was um, uh, um, procured. Um, and... The question halfway down the page is, was that done, um, that's, that is the purchase of commercial products, by a direct contract between the centre and the suppliers, or was there bulk purchase, or how was it done? And Professor um, Savage's answer was, it, it, well, it well depended who felt they could possibly get the best deal out of the commercial companies. So you would perhaps have a rather cavalier pharmacist who would negotiate on behalf of the district hospital because it was district money, the direct contract was with the district, not with Elstree, not with RHL, not with blood transfusion. So if you had an adventurous pharmacist who wished to negotiate with his charming Americans, that was fine. So just pausing there, Professor Savage suggesting that there was a role in the procurement of commercial products for the hospital pharmacist. Then he says, if you had, on the other hand, an entrepreneurial doctor, God forbid, you would find that he might do it and they had to hand the numbers to make sure there was some form of cost effectiveness. So one didn't buy in bulk enough for 10 years and realise that after six months it had all gone out of date. So appearing to recognise there that, however, doctors could effectively have their own direct communications with the pharmaceutical companies for the purchase of products, as we have seen from some of the correspondence. Um, uh, and then he says... the. Local blood transfusion directors within the district sometimes would take responsibility for the purchase of it and store it within the hospitals. So it was very much something which was hit and miss, um, but invariably the people who actually did the negotiation were those who notionally took responsibility for the budget. Um, and if we go to the bottom of the page, he says that was the way the funding at that stage was organised in 1979. There was a central purchasing facility, which I don't know very much about. Um, and then um, uh, he talks halfway down the following page about how um, he would always um, uh, estimate twice as much as was needed. 
And then he's, the chair asks a question about the use of a central purchasing facility, and he says, I don't know, I never needed to use it, but because, because by the time I arrived there, it had been abandoned because it was a bit of a catastrophe, so it was really left up to the individual districts to negotiate with their money, with the individual commercial companies for the amount of product they considered was necessary uh, at um, a, a certain um, price. So it, it's not perhaps an entirely clear picture which emerges um, from um, Professor Savage about the purchasing arrangements, but th those are his own words in, in 2007. Um, we'll, we'll come back in, in, in a little more detail to what he, he says further about um, visits from pharmaceutical companies. The, the next theme I wanted to make some reference to was um, issues of supply, in particular supply of NHS product, and, um, and um, both to St Thomas's directly uh, and in terms of broader concerns about national self-sufficiency. We can see, or we have seen from documents from the 1970s, that Professor Ingram repeatedly raised concerns about insufficient supplies of, of um, LHS product. Um, uh, um, and we, uh, that, 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 there was reference to that, for example, in that meeting from, from 1970. If we look at... CBLA 0000210, please. This is June 1974. This is a concern about lack of sufficient funds to purchase concentrate being expressed. Um, uh, it's a letter from the regional medical officer to Professor Ingram recording discussions with the Department of Health. I've talked to the department about your request for further funds to be made available for the purchase of AHG concentrate for haemophilic surgery. You're right in your statement that DHSS is unable to grant additional money for 74-75 onwards. It's left to the regional health authority to decide whether the development should be underwritten. I appreciate your views about the inadequacy of supplies of AHG concentrate, and the suggestion is that he approaches the area medical officer. Um, we can see it, it remains a concern. So when we look at DHSC 000291 underscore 016, We can see here um, now a broader concern about um, funding and availability of concentrate. This is December 1978. It's Dr. Waiter at the DHSS to Professor Ingram, and it's clearly in response to a, a, a letter from Professor Ingram. It says, by coincidence, on the same day as I received copies of your correspondence with Sir Henry Yellowlees, that's the chief medical officer, Dr. Buxton passed to me your letter dated the 11th of December on the subject of NHS production of factor eight. The point you make about increasing expenditure on NHS manufacturer is one which a number of people have made to the department. But as yet, no mechanism exists for diverting money which would be spent by health authorities from allocated funds to a central fund for expenditure on the central processing laboratories of the National Blood Transfusion Service. We, in fact, know the total sum spent on factor eight from commercial sources, as we have in confidence from those firms which sell the material to haemophilia centers or their agents, returns giving the information in terms of units of factor eight supplied. Of course, we don't know the negotiated price of the material. Based on the quoted manufacturer's prices, we can calculate what's likely to be the total, but on the high side, it's still a large sum per annum and we're actively seeking ways to find more money for the central labs, including cooperation of regions. The equation is more complex than at first sight, as you will appreciate. And then this one real problem is to know the real target for the self-sufficiency the NHS is striving for. Our working target is 50 million units of factor eight con per annum for England and Wales. But for example, Dr. Lane claims this will be much higher. Mm. To make realistic and lasting plans, we must have a target. I would value your views on this. So. We can see Professor Ingram's raising essentially two issues. One is funding uh, to enable 
if necessary, the purchase of, of, of commercial concentrate and consideration there to some form of central funding. And the second is the issue of supply and uh, self-sufficiency. Uh, and that, um, there's a number of documents which show it. I won't go to, 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 to most of them, but that, that was a concern of Professor Ingram's. We can see, for example, from a letter he wrote to um, uh, the Lancet, um, Henry, could we have HSOC 002702? Uh, the first part of this is a bulletin from the Haemophilia Society in August of 1974 where they say, during the past few weeks, there's been a good deal of correspondence in the Lancet, which has highlighted how the financial troubles of the NHS are affecting the supplies of materials used for the treatment of haemophilia. And then reference is made to a letter from Dr. Biggs, stating that because of the shortage of material, 90% of haemophilic patients are receiving less than the optimum treatment. Essential but non-urgent operations are being postponed. Delay is arising in putting patients onto home treatment. And then it said other doctors have written giving their views. And we can see that if we go to, if we go first of all to page five. There's a long letter there from Dr. Biggs. I'm going to look at that tomorrow in the Oxford presentation, so I, I won't go to the detail of it now. But if we go over the page, we see the letter of support from Professor Ingram. It's the top left-hand um, entry, please. Henry, blood fractions for treatment of haemophilia. I write to support Dr. Biggs' plea for a realistic supply of blood fractions for treating haemophilia. For 20 years, we've been able to make a precise diagnosis. For 10 years, the preparation of appropriate blood fractions has been possible. We know that treatment material is being provided within the health service in increasing amounts, but it is still far short of what we need. Until the NHS provision is adequate, it is cruel not to make good the shortfall from large supplies of good commercial material, which, as Dr. Biggs says, are now available. And then if we go um, to the last sentence of the, uh, the letter, money must be found so that sufficient may be purchased until NHS resources are adequate. So again, it's a twofold plea um, from 1974. One is for increased production of NHS material, so self-sufficiency, but the other is for more money to enable haemophilia centres through whatever precise contractual route to well, purchase that, that, commercial That takes me back to the, the previous document we looked at, DHSC 402191 underscore 016. Can you just go back to that for a moment? Do you need it again, Henry? DHSC 000 underscore 016. And you, you pointed out there were two different uh, matters addressed. One was um, money uh, for expenditure. The other was self-sufficiency. Might it be that the letter, in fact, was drawing those two together? Because if one looks uh, at the first few lines, um, the point you make about increasing expenditure in NHS manufacture is one number of people have made. But then that's talking about manufacture. As yet, no mechanism exists for diverting money which would be spent by health authorities with allocated funds to a central fund that is not for purchase. It's for expenditure on the central processing laboratories, the NBTS. So it's yes. talking about funding not for buying, but for creating the infrastructure to produce. It, it is. Uh, and that's I, I think, might be... Uh, a little different from the, the emphasis which you've just given from the letter yes. of uh, which Ingram wrote to the in support of Biggs. Y yes, you, you, you're absolutely right. So there are, there are, funding is being raised in, 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 in slightly different ways in those two letters. So in the 1974 letter to the Lancet, it's a twofold plea. One is in support of self-sufficiency. The other is until you have self-sufficiency, you need to give us the money so that we can buy commercial concentrates to make up the shortfall. Um, this um, and that's 1974, and there are there are a number of other letters in which, in 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 the course of the 70s, Professor Ingram corresponds with, amongst others, Dr. Maycock, about the specific lack of funding for for, for St. Thomas's. Um, 
uh, you're right, sir, that this letter in December 1978 is looking at a, a different aspect of funding. In other words, um, the uh, um, funding that would need to be made available to build up the infrastructure uh, for increased NHS production, albeit then Dr. Waiter is is suggesting that there might be some form of equation to be done by looking at the funding that is currently spent on, on commercial concentrates. So the, the, the first one, the 74, is you're not giving us enough. We've got to go and buy it elsewhere. Give us the money. The second is uh, to buy it. Uh, the second is um, we're not getting enough. Give us more money so that we can make it. Yes. Um, uh, and, and we've set out um, in, in the, the written presentation, as I say, I won't go to all the documents, some of the communications and pleas for product um, that, that Professor Ingram makes to, to, to Dr. Makeup, Makeup on a number of occasions. Turning to Professor Savage, um, again, the, perhaps the best source of, of, of insight into Professor Savage's views on, on the issue of self-sufficiency and NHS production comes from, in his own words, from his evidence um, to um, Archer. Um, if we start with his written evidence, Henry, that's ARCH 0002508 underscore 002. Um, so th this was a, the, the um, written uh, statement dated the 17th of September that D Professor Savage sent to the Archer Inquiry. If we turn to the top of page three. Uh, in fact, we can pick it up from the bottom of page two. Sorry, Henry. Because it ties in with the observation that, that, that you were making, Sarah, about that 1978 letter. Um picking it up in the last six lines, the funding of such projected increased expenditure on product would require central support. That was only forthcoming through the RHA's funding for the allocation to all DGHs, so that's regional health authorities and then district general hospitals, I think, to disperse to each and every discipline to fund ongoing service and proposed development. Consequently, little money, if any, reached hospitals treating haemophilia patients with the proposed requirement for additional replacement therapy. And then he says this, and further reliance of any increased product supply was demanded of an inert blood transfusion service and a terminally failing BPL fractionation facility. Thus, extra money when found was spent on the purchase of commercial imported factor eight concentrate, usually from the US, in preference to the safer cryoprecipitate that was the recommend treatment, probably it's meant to be recommended, treatment of children and mild haemophilia patients assuming failure with DDAVP, generally available in some regions in excess. So we see there, and we'll, we'll see it in Professor Savage's oral evidence, he's fairly scathing about BPL. And he's identifying there that the money that is provided ultimately from central government was being spent on the commercial concentrates rather than um, building up BPL. But you, So you may be interested in his observation about cryoprecipitate, both that it was safer and that it was the recommended treatment for children and mild haemophilia patients. Of course, we, we can't tell from that particularly what point in time he's referring to. Um, if we go on in this same document to the last page, we can see again, P Professor Savage doesn't mint his words. From the events prior to 1979 and between the years 1979 to 1986, decisions regarding blood products for the management of haemophilia were, in my view, prioritised by the financial and political considerations of the blood transfusion services and by the BPL plasma fractionation facility. In terms of factors of relevance to the failure of the blood transfusion services and BPL, in affecting self-sufficiency and eliminating plasma product contamination. One must attribute the failures 
to poor leadership relying on the assumed safety of BPL's products and reluctance to endorse intensive research into treat, into treat inactivated products. That must be heat. Heat inactivated products, yes. And inferior reactive management to restructure the blood transfusion service to introduce greater safety aspects with donor selection and improved productivity, productivity and efficiency to achieve uh, self-sufficiency. Central financial considerations determined by general healthcare political motives, in my view, led to the eventual lack of political will to spearhead these essential changes that were quite evident by 1978 for hepatitis and 1982 for HIV, which for the experts in the field felt assured that a potential public health catastrophe was beginning to unfold. So as Professor Savage's evidence, oral evidence to, to the Archer Inquiry made clear, he finished this in the middle of the night and he did recognise there were a number of typographical errors in it. But there's obviously a, an awful lot to unpick thematically in his evidence there. He is critical of the blood transfusion service. He is critical of BPL. Um, uh, he is critical of assumptions about the safety of BPL products. He is critical of the failure to... Uh, um, support intensive research into viral inactivation by, by heat treatment uh, um, and to um, what he says are, um, were omissions, failures on the part of the blood transfusion service uh, to do more in relation to safety, for example, by way of donor selection. So there's a whole range of issues that ultimately you'll, you'll need to consider, but we, we see there the kernel of, of Professor Savage's And he puts views. it in the context of two dates. Yes, so he, he is saying that it's quite evident by 1978, one, one could read this as saying uh, that he was calling for there to be greater research into heat inactivation in 1978 onwards. Yes, uh, the, the, there's a more detailed discussion of heat, heat inactivation in his oral evidence, which I'll, I'll, I'll look at a, li a little later. Um, there's, there's just one further document where we see Professor Savage's views on self-sufficiency um, set out a little more contemporaneously um, than, than his Archer evidence. It's CBLA 0002399. Um, and we can see there it's, it's the minutes of a meeting headed AIDS, HIV and haemophilia held in Manchester in January of 1988. Um, it's said to be a, a meeting in Manchester of the UK Haemophilia Association. Um, uh, it's um, a, a record, I think, by Dr Lane of, of, um, of BPL. Um, and we can just pick it up halfway down the page. There's a the range of issues uh, relating to HIV that are discussed. But his first observation here, concluding comments made by Dr Savage, were in three areas. One... The requirement for factor eight in UK patients would continue to rise, would always create demand, which was ahead of NHS supply. NHS self-sufficiency was therefore a myth, and it was important to decide which products should be selected by haemophilia directors for treatment of first-time users of coagulation products. Now, it may be that what he's doing there is looking at the position solely from the perspective of 1988, and he's looking forward from that point in time, and um, because he then talks to talks about his clear preference for wet pasteurised products for this purpose. And then we see Professor Bloom's preference for NHS 8Y. Um, uh, and uh, we can just note at the top of the next page Dr Lane's observation. Um, Haemophilia directors continue to demonstrate their mixed attitudes towards self-sufficient NHS provision uh, of coagulation factors. So th th that, that is, again, a, a snapshot from 1988 of, of what was being considered and discussed in relation to self-sufficiency by that time. Um, we can, oh, I know at the time, the, there's quite a long passage from Professor Savage's oral evidence about heat treatment that we need to look at, but we'll do that after lunch, sir. Uh, yes, so uh, two o'clock. Two o'clock. 